right, You're, we're back. We're live here in Think Tech. Uh, we're doing transitional justice here at the four o'clock block with our old friend, Nicholas Sussman Heran. Um, welcome to the show, Nicholas. Always nice to see your smiling face. Hi, Jay. Thank you so much. And it's always a pleasure to be here. Nicholas joins us from Columbia. Uh, and we talk about um, uh, Project Expedite Justice. We talk about atrocities and uh, war crimes. And we talk about today, we talk about the the case of London Energy um, seems like a Swedish prosecutor recently indicted the chairman and CEO of London Energy, which is uh, what I guess in Sweden for London is spelled L-U-N-D-I-N for aiding and abetting in the commission of war crimes in Sudan back in 1997-2003. And uh, we would like to know more about that and um, and, and find exactly what the trend is here. You know, I, I have to say it, it reminds me of, the, of, a, of a visit we had here in Hawaii from a woman who was teaching um, economics at MIT. And what she said, and I'm sure this is good fodder for our discussion, Nicholas, what she said was, you gotta follow the money. If you measure the amount of, um, in intercompany, intercountry payments in the world, that's a certain dollar amount. But if you measure the amount of intra company payments, multinationals and the like doing business in other countries or globally, that's way more. Money is power. And so from a global point of view, money is power. And, and, and we have to look at that in terms of dealing with what they do globally and how they get in trouble, how they violate morality and, and war crime laws. So uh, Nicholas, tell us what happened in Sweden. Tell us what happened with London Energy. Right, uh, so as you said, London Energy is a Swedish corporation. They have been in the energy sector since forever, oil, petroleum, now energy in a broad sense. Uh, and their history in, in Sudan, actually in what today is South Sudan, but the, the place now is located in South Sudan, but when the crimes were committed, it was in Sudan before it split into Sudan and South Sudan, right? Um, so this is a case that has been in, on, the, on the radar of the Swedish prosecution since around 2010 uh, for their aiding and abetting of this, of, of this war crimes, right? Uh, so the Sudanese government since 1989, uh, when, well, former president Omar al-Bashir uh, conducted a coup and then decided to establish his government, a heavily military-oriented government, radical, uh, allied with some uh, paramilitary forces and so on, and committed a wide range of atrocities all around the, the country, well, has been, has been in that business. And foreign multinational corporations have not been, uh, well, foreign to this to these things, right? Uh, Sudan is a country that has oil, that has gold, that has a series of resources, and the government way of, of getting funds for itself and also to, to profit itself, because it, it has been demonstrated that, that the Sudanese government during the coup was, uh, was dealing with enormous amounts of corruption, uh, decided to grant uh, concessions for oil, for gold, for different types of resources. Uh, the case of London was in a place called um, Area 5A, Block 5A is, is the name. It's, it's uh, located uh, in the north part, more or less, of South Sudan, uh, and it's an oil concession. It, it was found by Chevron, and then they stopped um, exploding that because it, has, it has, is a heavily contested area, right? It has always been contested between the government who hasn't managed to control it, and, uh, well, rebel forces that also uh, want to have control, territorial control over the area, and the civilians are just in the middle, right? Uh, so what happened in 1999, 1987, more or less, when London was granted this concession with other corporations, is that they needed uh, the area to be secure to start their operation, right? Uh, and what they did through a series of actions and decisions was tell the government, you know, if you want us to explode this place, if you want us to pay, uh, well, the fees we have to do it for exploding the concessions and so on. It's your responsibility to clear the area so we can do it, right? Uh, to guarantee security. And uh, 
they already knew about the, the human rights track record of, of, of the Sudanese government, or, or that is what the, the NGO that brought the claim and the prosecution, the Swedish prosecution said, is that they knew it has been more or less 10 years since the government of South Sudan have been doing that, and it was wide known that they did this type of things. Uh, so if you asked for that clearance, if you asked for security, if you asked for all type of things, what you were actually asking them was to conduct an operation uh, to clear the rebels, but also to clear the civilians, right? And that's that's the core thing under under international humanitarian law that is like the mirror area of the of the law of war crimes. Civilians have to be spared from conflict. That's that's the rule. You cannot kill civilians. You cannot directly target civilians. And even if there are collateral damage, you have to restrict that and be very cautious about it. So overall, through all of these requests to clear the area, to guarantee security uh, and so on, what London was doing was to some extent endorsing the government to conduct these operations and either ignoring uh, the human rights uh, violations record of the government or uh, actually assuming the risk of those human rights violations, right? So it could be like some um some disregard for the record or even an assumption on of of, of that costs to, to achieve it and, and that's the core um element of the case for, for the Swedish prosecution under their standards of, of criminal law either of these two ways are sufficient to prove some sort of intent um so yeah that's that's the case and the case have been in investigation since 2010 all the proceedings uh, have been going on and finally the, the indictment took place uh, earlier this year against this this former CEO, now member of the board, and another high-ranking officer. Um, and, and, and it's going into trial in, in early 2022. That is the that is the, the expectation. Well, I guess we're looking at the potential, potentially good outcome here. How does the case look? going forward. Um, you think the trial will be a successful prosecution? And what will happen in the courts of, I guess it's the courts of Sweden, eh? Right. So I can only tell you what you see online, what's open source. And, and as a good lawyer, I, I, I know that you can only say an outcome based on the evidence, right? Uh, but it seems that they have very strong evidence, uh, well, knowing how prosecutors work, uh, also knowing that as a prosecutor, when you face such a big case, you don't want to, to step forward unless you have evidence, right? Um, and uh, I was reading a bit about the Swedish legal system today, just preparing this because I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert, of course, on that. And um, prosecutors have the obligation to go into trial if they have the evidence. There's no discretion as, as it could be in other systems and, and so on. They have the obligation. Um, and again, considering the reputational risk and even the financial risk in a, in a lawsuit uh, for, for uh, improper prosecution or whatever, uh, you could say that the, the case seems strong. Also, they have had several rounds of, of appeals and, uh, and complaints throughout the process, like building up to the trial and um, Lunding has lost in, in all of the scenarios. So it seems that the case is, is strong, uh, although they haven't had the chance to actually look at the evidence, right? Uh, but but there, are, there are things that tell you that it could be strong. Even for this type of cases, they have to ask for, permit, for permission from the government to do it, and the government gave permission. Uh, so, so you could say that if even the Swedish government is, is willing to, to assume this, these risks before uh, one of its uh, big corporations and so on, the case should be solid. That's but it's pure assumptions, but, but you could say so. And it's just the final set that's missing. How did this case get started? I mean, I, I suppose uh, some human rights organization, maybe like Project Expedite Justice, um, finds out that this was happening in Sudan. Um, they investigate, they get documents, and they deliver their, the product of their investigation to the prosecutors in Sweden. And the prosecutors say, hmm, this involves a Swedish company, we have to take action. And they take that information, validate it and prosecute it. I, mean, I know this is compressing a you know, 10 or even a 20 year process into a few words, but is that what happens at least in a case 
um, in Sweden. And I'm really interested in the point that once faced with prosecutable, you know, evidence of prosecutable crimes, the Swedish prosecutor must prosecute. He he doesn't have the discretion, um, and that and that and that avoids the the political experience, the political choice making, the political pressure that will happen in other countries like the U.S. Okay, am I right about how it gets to the prosecutor? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and and you would say that this is the only way in which this universal jurisdiction cases get there, right? Um, it it is uncommon for, for domestic prosecutors to, to reach that far. So usually it's precisely there's the situation. A human rights organization went, discussed with the victims, with the stakeholders, gathered evidence that they could do it because it's easier to do it when you're a private entity, such as NGO, or you're directly with the victims. If you were an unofficial mission, you would, you would alert the, 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 the Sudanese or the South Sudanese, in this case, government. So precisely they created, they collected the evidence, and then they delivered it to the, to the Swedish prosecutors. And then they decided that it was enough to move forward. They cross-checked everything, conducted a couple of interviews on their own, and then decided to move forward with the case. From, from an example, from a, a, the vantage of, uh, call it Swedish uh, law and practice and culture, you know, and mm, what do you want to say, governmental perception, um, why, why is the Swedish government interested in doing this? Because, you know, they're, they're not making friends with London Energy, for sure, or the friends of London Energy, or the average Swedish person on the street. Um, why, why have they taken this burden? Um, aren't they affected, at least by public opinion, that might be to the contrary? I mean, is it that the Swedish people, the Swedish government, the Swedish culture is outraged by stories of, of human rights violations to the point where there is no choice for anybody but to take up the prosecution against this big Swedish company? Well, I, I would say precisely that. Uh, uh, of course, they're going to, to, to have to to assume the, the reputational risk, they impact the public opinion and so on. But precisely as you were saying, the, the legal structure of the system forces the prosecutor to move forward with the, with the prosecution if there's evidence. So the political decision is not on them. Uh, for this foreign case, as I told you, there's a requirement to, to ask for permission from the government. Uh, but first, there's, these are countries that have a very high standard of rule of, of law, right? Uh, so I think that when you're based there and you're an executive uh, government official, facing that the legal judicial requirements are there, uh, deciding to halt the investigation at that point would be an undue interference into the, into the tasks of the judiciary, right? Uh, that's, that's the first thing. And the other thing is that precisely because of that, because of the requirements that the judiciary has, the prosecutor in this case, um, it would be very evident that your, that your decision is political, right? And that you're making a political decision uh, before uh, a case of, of gross human rights violations, of war crimes. Um, and you would be, in a sense, also be trampling your own international human rights obligations because war crimes well, are, are what international lawyers call customary law. They're enforced by everyone. Everyone has to prosecute them. The countries have the task to prosecute their own individuals or extradite them for these purposes. So there's a lot of like legal restraints on, on the government um, that require them to, to do it. And these are countries with a very strong and a very solid human rights record, right? Uh, so maybe when, when you balance the, the outcome, it's, it's better to protect your human rights record than, than to protect the company and then comes the trial, right? So even if you're going to trial, there's still a lot to do uh, and you're not making a decision as government there. That's that's in the, on the judge's uh, shoulders. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what, what you've described is is commendable on the part of the Swedish institutions, and for that matter, the, the Swedish government and public. Uh, we should only have the same uh, view of things um, and view of the rule of law here in this country right now. But um, at the same time, it strikes me that what happened in Sudan with London Energy is really egregious. Um, they knew this was going to result in war crimes. They were party 
um, to what happened and to the deaths of many people uh, in order to satisfy some, what do you want to call it, some corrupt mentality, a corrupt corporate mentality. And you wonder, I mean, Sudan is one place, but you wonder if they were doing business in other places in Africa or elsewhere in the world in developing countries where they're doing precisely the same thing. You know, you have um, a security problem, you go to the government um, and you make a, an arrangement, which happens to be a, a war crime to do that, um, to have uh, civilians killed so that uh, you don't have any security problem anymore. Um, I'm wondering if there's been any news or expectation that London will be found to have involved itself in the same procedures, in the same violations in other countries in Africa or elsewhere. Is it just limited to Sudan? Well, on, on, on my research for, for this, I didn't find anything else, although the situation is not uncommon, uh, not only with, with London, right, uh, but, but with many corporations worldwide, because as you, as, as, as you mentioned earlier, uh, the dynamic is the same, right? Uh, global South countries are full of resources. They want foreign investment. They struggle with rule of law issues, uh, even with conflict and so on, uh, and the resources are, are just there. There's no local uh, corporations or they're not as, as, as profitable as the foreign ones. So that the foreign ones get the concessions and then, well, it's a cycle that, that repeats itself, right? So because as, as, as a global South country, you want to keep your investors happy, right? So they will keep investing and like the, the narrative is that that will bring development, that will bring wealth, that will get you out of development. But then the, the dark side that, that no one is looking at is that this is done at the expense of the local communities, right? That are expelled, that are targeted, that are evicted, that are dispossessed, because London is one of the cases, right? And there was conflict, right? There was a rebel group there. But in many cases, there's no rebel groups. There's just, I don't know, other communities and they're just in the way, uh, so they are removed because the concession is already granted and the government didn't care, didn't ask or, yeah, just didn't take care of the population, right? What, what is it about Sudan that gets it, Sudan in so much trouble? You know, it, it strikes me that what you said is very important. They have resources and they have a dictator at the time by the name Bashir. They still have government problems, obviously. Um, and he was a really bad guy into corruption. Um, so you have resources that make people wealthy and you have corruption and thus a, a weak institutional government. Um, and, um, and then you have a foreign corporation that wants to come in and seize this opportunity um, and does it. But uh, is, Sudan's not the only place like that. But Sudan seems to be special, no? It's got a special mixture of valuable resources, corruption, bad leaders, um, and thus it is, um, a, it's a good target uh, for companies that want to go off the side like London. Um, am I right? Yeah, no, I think it's precisely that. It's precisely that. And, and you have a government, well, you had a government that didn't actually cared about uh, like keeping good impressions even, right? Uh, so they, they granted the concessions, they were full of conflict, they were uh, an ethnic-based conflict, right? So they, they, they quite, uh, clearly differentiated groups of people based on ethnicity and there were ethnicities that under you were just expendable. Uh, so they, they didn't care to do what they needed to, to, to keep enriching themselves. Um, because there are studies by, by other NGOs that says that, that Sudan at, at the time of Bashir complied with all the elements of what we call like autocracy, right? So it's a group uh, and the lead, a small lead that use violence, human rights violations, corruption, crime, et cetera, to gain power uh, legally or illegally, in this case, illegally through the coup. And then they use the violence to first keep themselves in power, second, silent opposition, and third, uh, profit themselves from, from the country, right? So there's no differentiation between the government and, um, and the personal uh, belongings and, and, uh, yeah. and property and, and so on. And they just use this, the state and the government to enrich themselves and engage with, with this. Well, well in, in these activities with local corporations or even international corporations, we're just wanting to have an in into the country and 
to be honest, all of this human rights and business, business and human rights, ethical standards, due diligence is not as, as, as old as we would like it to be and not as enforced as, as we would like it to be. Mm -hmm. Although we're making progress there, of course. Well, one thing that strikes me is that corruption leads inevitably um, to human rights violations and violence, uh, especially where there's money involved. Corruption, uh, corruption is a, a few people getting rich at the at the hands of everyone else, um, and in order to maintain their power, uh, to uh, enhance their their wealth, um, they do things like this, including corporations. Uh, so you know, I um, I guess there's two solutions, just just logically. Uh, one solution is to have a strong, um, responsible, not corrupt government. Uh, so that if you you know if you can if you can suppress the corruption, then this whole process is suppressed, and then when um, some multinational like London Energy comes in, um, you can manage them. You can manage what they do. Uh, you've got but you've got to have a strong, responsible, accountable, you know, fair-minded humanitarian government there. And Sudan doesn't have that. It didn't have it then, and it doesn't have it now. So it remains, um, you know, vulnerable to this kind of attack. I, I, I see it as an attack by a multinational that wants to make money and, and will use these techniques. The, and the other thing, of course, is what's happening in Sweden, the prosecution. So obviously it's best to have both of those things working, a strong government, a responsible government in the country like Sudan, um, which you can't always have, and uh, the prosecutions, which you can't always have. Uh, so, you know, I'm wondering, you know, what you see as the more successful of the two possible approaches. And I'm wondering where the United Nations would be in the International Court of Justice. Why isn't this case pending there? Um, why Sweden instead? Do we have a global arrangement, a, a global institutional organization or system um, to deal with this on both sides of the, the coin to help a country that needs help um, so it has strong institutions and to punish war crimes in a systematic international way rather than just the country of Sweden. Right, right. So so on the United Nations and International Court Justice side and, and so on, uh, so we have two issues from the side of the United Nations, uh, their capacity to enforce things and so on is very limited, right? And, and that's not, not the fault of the, of the institution as such, uh, but of, of the states that, that made it to be extremely limited, right? Um, yeah, I, I always say that the UN is like a party and if the party is bad, many times you have to blame the guests, right? Not, not the party itself, the party is about the guests. So that's the thing. And there have been some developments like business and human rights principles and things like that. But first, well, the states are the ones who appear before the UN uh, and they don't want anyone meddling that much with their own companies. So these principles are not legally binding, they're important, but they're just advice and recommendations and so on, right? Uh, and regarding the International Court of Justice, it only allows for country to country complaints, right? So you would have to have, I don't know, Sudan or South Sudan or any other country bringing uh, Sweden to the uh, International Court of Justice for the breach of international obligations. And there have been a couple of cases uh, regarding human rights uh, before the International Court of Justice, but these cases are very long, are very complex, trying to link the act of the company to the country and then to international violation. Oh, it's, it's very complicated, right? So, you're going to, to have a lot of expectations for a justice that could take too long to, to arrive if it does at all. And then how this will reflect in, con, in, in consequences, right? Because what, what you have at the, at the International Court of Justice is just state liability and some orders of reparations perhaps, and, and so on. But, but for, the, for the victims, you don't have that much, right? Then you can start saying, okay, let, let's look at the, um, at the International Criminal Court, for example, that's another another option. It has more to do with war crimes. It has individual liability and so on. Uh, but then the way in which the the ICC works uh, is complicated. 
South Sudan does not belong. Sudan does not belong. Uh, there was a referral by the Security Council, but it's very limited to the Darfur region. So you start having a lot of jurisdictional of jurisdictional obstacles. That's the first one, and the second operational ob obstacles. Right? We think these courts because they are international. They have a lot of power, they have a lot of budget, and that's not the reality. They're severely, severely limited, right? Uh, so that's complicated. Actually, I, I think that this domestic prosecutions can be a very good option for accountability. Domestic systems have much more capacity than international courts. They can deal with individual cases in an easier way. Uh, in the case of London, for example, they have jurisdiction uh, over the, the Swedish prosecution and courts have jurisdiction over their people. And ultimately the, the responsibility for human rights protection and prosecution for international crimes always relies first and foremost on, on states. So I think this, this is good. This is not entirely bad. Um, and they have much more enforcement capacity, right? Uh, mm -hmm. They can seize goods, they can, uh, um, issues of penis, they can do a lot of things that maybe the International Criminal Court, International Justice cannot do, so that, that is good. Yeah, let's, uh, let's move to that, um, because, you know, um, let's, let's take uh, a country that uh, ostensibly was or could be, or maybe to some extent is a world leader. Let's take the United Nations, uh, United States, which is the birthplace of the United Nations um, and the Marshall Plan, and, uh, you know, sort of a moral leadership. Let's take the United States. Um, and, and let's assume, which I think is probably a good assumption, that London Energy also does business here and has resources and assets and banks on Wall Street right here. Um, and let's take a country that at least, um, you know, has a court system. Could this prosecution have taken place in the United States? should it have taken place in the United States? If you were a prosecutor or an investigator for that matter, would you bring this case to the United States? Well, you have options in the United States, right? Uh, the relationship between the United States and international law is a bit different than it is in the rest of the, of the world. Uh, you have a different incorporation model of international law, other countries rather incorporated and find ways to apply directly in, in their own system or create incorporation laws and so on. The US is a bit more um, complicated than that, right? And, and it's for a reason, it's to, to protect itself for international intervention and, and to be too vulnerable to international things. Uh, nonetheless, is, that, is, that, is that a defensible reason? I remember there was a case in somewhere in Africa, maybe it was Sudan also, uh, which um, might have gone to the courts in in uh, the U.S., but instead went to the courts in France, uh, which had a more receptive, um, you know, set of laws for that kind of uh, war crimes case. Uh, more receptive than the United United States. We don't seem to care about war crimes as much as France does or Sweden. So, so. Um, Query, um, um, don't you think we could be doing more? They, they could be more, more options, absolutely. And, and of course, when you have the, the US legal system on, on top of you as a corporation, you're going to be more afraid than that. But there have been also good examples of not directly prosecutions, but lawsuits against corporations in the US for this type of things. And there you have like two big options, right? Uh, the first one is uh, civil liability tort law, uh, and you have the alien tort statute and, a, and another uh, series of statutes uh, that have been used for similar cases, uh, aiming for reparations, right? Usually they end on settlements or monetary compensations that it's arguable if that is the right decision to, to go for, but at the end, at least you have funds, right? You have money to give to the victims, and maybe that's better than the than having the CEO in jail. That's, that's an option. And the other option that the US has and, and has become pretty popular and also imitated by, by other countries are sanction regimes, right? So it's more uh, administrative law and it's like US registered corporations or, corpor or corporations in the US that do business with corporations in other countries that are involved in this type of international uh, crimes, torture and, and so on. Uh, could be you could bring a complaint before before the sanctions regimes and you have the OFAC system or the Magnitsky system 
and then you more or less blacklist this these corporations and of course that has a, a huge impact on your yes on your oh yes stuff. Right. Well, on, on that same on that same notion, and you know, uh, I was mentioning before this uh, MIT professor came around to Hawaii and and made the point, which I think is a really important point, is that it's the money that counts. Follow the money. So if I have a multinational like London, and there's so many multinationals that you know escape taxes and do all kinds of things that are hmm, embarrassing, um, you know that uh, a, a criminal prosecution such as the one going on now in Sweden with the indictments and criminal trials may not be the best solution. Um, a civil action uh, with like treble damages or punitive civil damages might be a, a better, a better uh, option because A, the stockholders are going to say, and they're interested in the bottom line, is what happened here? How come we just lost 10, 20 billion dollars over this case? Um, somebody isn't managing the company right. Let's look at our directors. Let's look at our officers. Uh, let's look at what they're doing and let's, you know, either replace them or discipline them in some way. Um, and let's, let's, uh, let's, let's fix this. Um, so you and have all this pressure by the stockholders when they realize that they're the object of their investment is going off the rails. Um, so I, I don't think that's going to happen. In the Swedish case, maybe somebody will go to jail, uh, but it's not the money. Um, wouldn't it be better, don't you think, Nicholas, if it was the money? Yeah, no, I, I agree with that, uh, and with two extra extra elements. The first one is that, well, you have to prosecute or or to bring some sort of accountability in the home countries of these corporations. They're very good at creating uh, subsidiaries. Uh, and, and creating an, an organizational structure to avoid accountability in, in global South countries. That's, that's, that's the first thing. So you have to go for the, for the home company and, and, and use that in, in their favor. And, and the other thing is, um, and also because the, the degree of evidence you need to prove this and those civil liability is way lower than, than than criminal law, right? Yes. Although well, you're yes. beyond reasonable doubt, here you can be before preponderance of evidence, or or it depends on the standards. Uh, and also, when these countries go to the global, these companies go to the global south, the imbalance in power, even before the governments in the global south, is huge. Is huge. So many times the governments have to give in to many things. Not that that excuses them, but uh, making them accountable at their own countries. Uh, has a different impact, right? They're, they're not going to fear a prosecution in Sudan, in South Sudan, if it would ever happen. But if they, you have that in the US, in Sweden, in Europe, well, the, the thing is different, right? Uh, so there are a lot of extra elements that, that have this impact. And of course, when, when you hit the money, the thing is much more complicated, right? And they care much more about it. Let me let me go to the, the last thing I wanted to ask you about, and, and that's this. It's just uh, maybe my observation. Uh, you're closer to it, but it seems to me that in sub-Saharan Africa, we have uh, an increase in governments that are failing, failing to meet the needs of the people. I mean, Sudan is only one example. Um, there's Ethiopia, there's uh, Somalia, there's uh, Rwanda, uh, and to some extent, the Congo. Congo I, I don't know how many others. Um, and, you know, there seems to be a kind of dynamic here, a trend, and every time you have a failed government, especially in a country with resources, you have the possibility that the London energy scenario will repeat itself right now. Uh, second of all, you have multinationals who like to be mm, unaccountable. They like to operate under the radar and do this kind of corruption and not, not say anything and make, make lots of money. Um, so my question to you is, Oh, and, and of course, the United Nations and the International Court of Criminal Justice has, has lots of burdens. As you said, it's complex um, to actually reach justice. The, the Swedish case is notable because there's a fair chance we're going to reach justice and it will have an effect on London. All that is good. But query, are we winning this game or are we losing this game? Where is it all going? Where is it all going in developing countries, not only in that continent, but other continents like Latin America, your continent? Um, are, we, are we doing better or worse? 
Um, um, should we be concerned that we have a, a decline of moral business? Actually, I would say we're improving. Usually I, I try to be more, more negative because that's the trend in many cases, but the, the rise in universal jurisdiction, the creation of new sanction regimes, uh, even the, the bringing of lawsuits in, in, in the home countries of these corporations actually is taking us into a better direction. And um, NGOs and uh, victims organizations are being much more pragmatic in their approach to these cases. And that is great. That is great uh, because yeah, you have London, but uh, a couple of years ago, you also had uh, a case against Shell, Shell in the Netherlands uh, for polluting the, the lands and rivers of a, of a community in, in Nigeria, if I'm not mistaken. And they lost the case and they had to pay a lot of for that. Uh, so I think if this keeps going on and these companies understand that they are assuming a bigger reputational financial uh, security risk, because that's 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 how you operate, right? As a company, you you do you do risk risk analysis, and you look at the trade-off, and then you decide. If you see that you're going to start losing and your risk is going to increase because you're not going to be able to escape that much. Um, then, then the thing will, will improve. And, and the trend legally is that it will improve because there are more systems being created. At first, the US had the Magnitsky system and the NOFAC. And last year, uh, the United Kingdom created a similar one. The EU created a new one. Australia created a new one because usually what these corporations do is that they try to escape the forum, right? So they're not registered in the US anymore. They go to Ireland or they go to Australia or they go to other countries. So the more countries that create this type of laws and regimes and so on, um, the more narrow space they will have to maneuver, right? And escape accountability. And at the end, uh, being accountable, doing proper due diligence, uh, not engaging in this type of behaviors, uh, mitigating the risks and so on is going to become a good business decision. Yes, I, well, I, 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 I want to uh, ask you one last thing. I can't resist. <laughs> There's another constituency here, and that is the stockholders themselves. All these multinationals are obviously public companies. They have stockholders, um, and I think a lot of stockholders, um, you know, just you know, clip the coupons. Um, they don't really watch for the impact of what their, you know, their company in which they own the stock is doing. And it seems to me there's an obligation now. It's not. It's more than it was before. We've been talking about impact investment for a long time, but it seems to me that if the stockholders got on board either individually or in groups and took steps to make sure that the company was doing the right thing or not doing the wrong thing, uh, we would have another control point on this kind of uh, war crimes um, problem. Uh, is this happening? Do you agree? Well, I agree that that should be done. I don't know how detailed they go into this and, that, and that that's something that honestly I haven't looked into, but I, I totally agree. I totally agree. And, and that would be even better, right? That would be much, much more better. Uh, because then you have control from the top. And then if the if the stakeholders associations, the assembly says, like, you cannot do this, these are, are no-go zones. And, and again, it does not have to be out of moral compass. We would like it to be, uh, but then it has to become, uh, we, we have to get to a point where violating human rights has to become bad business, right? Uh, and maybe all of these cases and so on should should uh, should drive into this, and maybe the stakeholders should should look at it because very big corporations are falling now. You're not looking like mid-range corporations. Lund is huge. Shell is huge. Uh, in the U.S., a couple of years ago, Chevron also lost a case. Uh, there are cases against Nestlé for their chocolate uh, extraction practices and so on. So, are big big corporations. Uh, so maybe this should send a message uh, to, to the stakeholders to see if they, if they do something. That would be the best scenario, of course. Uh, yeah. But I don't know that much is being done. Maybe in a couple of years, we'll see that impact and it would become a, a concern in the risk analysis programs and so on. So the, um, the Swedish case does reveal practices that are really awful. At the same time, the discussion with you today does, uh, does uh, provide a little optimism for the future. 
and um, and the discussion itself, not only with you and me, but other people and NGOs involved and investigators and prosecutors, it's all good. And hopefully we'll be able to bring, I shouldn't say we, but they, you, will be able to bring the world together to focus on this uh, so that um, you know it, it goes in the right direction. Thank you so much, Nicholas. Nicholas Sussman, I uh, really appreciate your participating in Think Tech and your discussion on these points. Thank you, Jay. Always a pleasure. Aloha. <laughs>